Draw My Life Joy Lewis When I was 14, I went walking in the park on a Sunday afternoon in clean, cold, luminous air. The trees tinkled with sleet, the city noises were muffled by the snow. Winter sunset with a line of young maples sheathed in ice between me and the sun, as I looked up they burned unimaginably golden, burned and were not consumed. I heard the voice in the burning tree. The meaning of all things was revealed, and the sacrament at the heart of all beauty lay bare. Time and space fell away, and for a moment the world was only a door swinging ajar. Then the light faded, the cold stung my toes, and I went home reflecting that I had had another aesthetic experience. I had them fairly often. That was what beautiful things did to you, I recognised, probably because of some visceral or glandular reaction that hadn't been fully explored by science just yet. For I was a well-brought-up, right-thinking child of materialism. Beauty, I knew, existed, but God, of course, did not. By now there is a whole generation like me in the cities of America. I was an atheist and the daughter of an atheist. I assumed that science had disproved God, just as I assumed that science had proved that matter was indestructible. A religious conviction was something nice people didn't have, something not to be mentioned in polite society. Before my time, an atheist had been essentially a religious man, one who had thought about God and thought hard, if not well. But my generation sucked in atheism with its canned milk. We hardly thought about it at all, and most of us were no less religious than many churchgoers. A young poet like myself could be seized and shaken by spiritual powers a dozen times a day and still take it for granted that there was no such thing as spirit. What happened to me was easily explained away. It was only nerves or only glands. As soon as I discovered Freud, it became only sex. And yet, if ever a human life was haunted, Christ haunted me. The country boy who comes to the big city often leaves his religion behind. My own parents were Jews, but their story differs only in degree from that of many Christians. They came to America as children, from small villages of Eastern Europe, where for a thousand years the Jews had held desperately to their faith against fire and terror and murder. Cut off, hemmed in, embittered. The Judaism of such villages resembled the taboo systems of savages more than it resembled the prophetic Judaism of the Old Testament or the philosophic and scholarly Judaism of medieval Western Europe. Six hundred and more ritual taboos governed daily conduct. Striking a match or stacking the dishes carelessly could be an offence against a very jealous God. This religion of the letter, rather than the spirit, heartened the Jews to endure their isolation. But it was kept going by persecution, as a dead man in a crowd may be kept on his feet by the pressure of those around him. In America, with the persecution removed, the corpse collapsed. Boys like my father, growing up in the polyglot world of New York, looked at their small-town religion and found it absurd. Many Jews got rid of the traditional forms of Judaism, but kept a vague and well-meaning belief in a vaguely well-meaning God, a sort of Unitarianism. Such halfway measures, however, were not for my parents or me. My father declared proudly that he had retained the ethics of Judaism, the only real part of it, and got rid of the theology, rather as if he had kept the top floor of our house, but torn down first floor and foundation. When I came along, I noticed that there was nothing supporting the ethics. Down it crashed. It's not true that an atheist cannot have any morality. What he cannot have is a rational morality. Unless we have a turn for philosophy, nine-tenths of our moral code will be habit and sentiment, coaxed into us by mama, knocked into us by papa. And ceasing to believe in God does not destroy a lifelong habit of telling the truth and holding the door politely for old ladies. My father persisted in justice, temperance, fortitude and prudence. He was used to them. 
It never occurred to him that, in the meaningless and purposeless universe of the atheist, moral ideas could only be something men had put together for their own convenience, like the horse and buggy, something you could scrap as soon as an automobile morality came along. And he tried his level best to pass his virtues on to me. Atheist virtues, however, don't keep very well. My parents had never been taught that faith and hope and charity were virtues at all. With no revealed law, no conviction of sin, no weekly reminder of shortcomings, no humility before God, no wonder at mystery, no hope of heaven, no help of grace, what can the best atheist do but turn Pharisee? Since he himself is the only standard of value he recognises, why shouldn't he be proud? Lacking God, the good man has a way of turning unco good. If he checks up on his own virtues, he can only do it by measuring himself against his neighbour, and that way lies damnation. For there are two ways of desiring virtue, and the whole gulf of hell lies fixed between them, between wanting to be good and wanting to be better than your neighbour. I declared my own atheism at the age of eight after reading H.G. Wells' Outline of History, allured thereto by enchanting pictures of dinosaurs. In a few years I had rejected all morality as a pipe dream. If life had no meaning, what was there to live for except pleasure? Luckily for me, my preferred pleasure happened to be reading, or I shouldn't have been able to stay out of hot water so well as I did. The only lasting damage my philosophy caused me was nearsightedness. If America had replaced my ancestral Judaism with other spiritual values, I might have been something better than a pleasure seeker. Let's face it though, what America stressed in the 20s, and stresses far too much even today, is physical satisfaction. Every day, in every way, the world was getting more comfortable. True patriots love their country because they serve her, but our schools and newspapers taught us to love her because she enriched us. Our love of country, the upshot proved, was often no deeper than any other kind of covered love. In 1929, I believed in nothing but American prosperity. In 1930, I believed in nothing. Men, I said, are only apes. Virtue is only custom. Life is only an electrochemical reaction. Mind is only a set of conditioned reflexes. And anyway, most people aren't rational like me. Love, art and altruism are only sex. The universe is only matter. Matter is only energy. I forget what I said energy was only. Portrait of the happy materialist. And yet it is no more than half the picture, for like most adolescents I was really two people. The hard, cocksure young atheist was largely what psychologists call a persona, a mask, a surface personality for dealing with the world. In the greedy, grabbing, big city, middle class world I knew, this seemed the sort of person that was wanted. But underneath the surface, my own real personality stirred, stretched its wings, discovered its own tastes. It was a girl, with vague eyes, who scribbled verses, scribbled them in a blind fury, not knowing what she wrote or why, and read them afterward with wonder. We call that fury poetic inspiration nowadays. We might be wiser to call it prophecy. This inner personality was deeply interested in Christ, and didn't know it. As a Jew, I had been led to feel cold chills at the mention of his name. Is this strange? For a thousand years, Jews have lived among people who interpreted Christ's will to mean floggings and burnings, gentlemen's agreements and closed universities. If nominal Christians so confuse their master's teaching, surely a poor Jew may be pardoned a little confusion. Nevertheless, I had read the Bible, for its literary beauty, of course, and I quoted Jesus unconsciously in everything I did, from writing verse to fighting my parents. My first published poem was called Resurrection a sort of private argument with Jesus, attempting to convince him, and myself, that he had never risen. 
I wrote it at Easter of all possible seasons and never guessed why. The cross recurs through most of my early poems and I seem to remember explaining that Jesus was a valuable literary convention. Those verses were mainly the desperate question, is life really only a matter of satisfying one's appetites or is there more? They make gloomy reading. An adult as consistently atheist as I was, of course, would be a gloomy cuss, obsessed by the futility of all things. But it was only in my prophetic moments that I asked such questions. My other self, the persona of daily life, was quite content to get its appetite satisfied and no questions asked. I suppose the very young carry a kind of insurance against atheist despair. Though they believe in nothing else, they will believe firmly in the importance of their own emotions and desires. Yet it's strange how completely I fail to see where my emotions and desires were leading. For what I read, eagerly and untiringly, was fantasy. Ghost stories and super science stories, George MacDonald in my childhood, Dunsany in my teens. I believed the three-dimensional material world was the only thing that existed, but in literature it bored me. I didn't believe in the supernatural, but it interested me above all else. Only, it had to be written as fiction. The supernatural presented as fact outraged my convictions. By disguising heaven as fairyland, I was enabled to love heaven. There is a myth that has always haunted mankind, the legend of the way out. A stone, a leaf, an unfound door, wrote Thomas Wolfe. The door leading out of time and space into somewhere else. We all go out of that door eventually, calling it death. But the tale persists that for a few lucky ones the door has swung open before death letting them through, perhaps for the week of fairy time, which is seven long years on earth, or at least granting them a glimpse of the land on the other side. The symbol varies with different men. For some, the door itself is important. For others, the undiscovered country beyond it, the Never Never Land, St Brendan's Island, the land of heart's desire. C.S. Lewis, whose Pilgrim's Regress taught me its meaning, calls it simply the island. Whatever we call it, it is more our home than any earthly country, and for me the myth took a specific form. As a child I had a recurring dream. I would walk down a familiar street which suddenly grew unfamiliar and opened onto a strange, golden, immeasurable plain where far away there rose the towers of fairyland. If I remembered the way carefully, the dream told me, I should be able to find it when I woke up. To conventional psychologists, I know, such visions are merely wishful thinking. But why should all human beings be born wanting something like that, unless it exists? The last time I had that dream, I was grown up, and so I put it in rhymes, which I should like to quote here, not for any intrinsic excellence, but as proof of the hope of heaven making itself known even to one so willfully blind as I. Fairy Tale At night, when we dreamed, we went down a street and turned a corner. We went down the street and turned the corner, and there, it seemed, there was the castle. Always, if you knew, if you knew how to go, you could walk down a street, the daylight street, that twisted about and ended in grass. There it was, always, the castle. Remote, unshadowed, childish, immortal, with two calm giants guarding the portal, stiff in the sunset, strong to defend, stood castle safety, at the world's end. O oh, castle safety, love without crying, honey without cloying, death without dying, hate and heartbreak, all were forgot there, 
We always woke. We never got there. A rather odd poem, perhaps, for the convinced atheist and communist who wrote it in 1940.